Gregory was always destined for greatness. It, it was in his name, after all. Actually, the great bit didn't get added to his name until afterwards, but it's true that he always seemed marked out for some significant role. Before he became a monk in the uh, mid-570s AD, he was already a senior political figure in the city of Rome. He didn't really want to be a bishop, or so the story goes. Apparently, he, um, he hid in a basket and was carried out of the city for a while in an attempt to avoid taking up the reins of power. All the same, he was made a bishop and became the Bishop of Rome in 590. As far as we can tell from the 854 letters that he left behind, he was deeply involved in the political, military, ecclesiastical and administrative affairs of his day. As he was such a good administrator and people were looking for competent leaders in a time of great upheaval, Gregory took command of Rome's police forces, uh, finances, food supply and water. He defended the city against barbarian hordes, all in the service of the poor, of course, or so he said. Uh, he didn't want to appear too grand, so he called himself Servant of the Servants of Christ. This, of course, is a papal title that has stood the test of time, although subsequent popes did not perhaps live out such a humble attitude in the way that they ruled. Gregory is almost um, as famous as a theologian and as a singer. It's from him that we get Gregorian chant. Although he probably didn't write so much of this stuff, really. Uh, one day, as he was wandering around in Rome, it said that Gregory was presented with some blonde-haired Anglo-Saxon children. He asked where they were from, and he was told that they were Angles. Apparently, he replied, oh, not Angles, but angels, if they become Christians. And so the story goes, he decided to send someone to go and evangelise these angelic people who lived on a certain island off the northwest coast of Europe. Uh, Gregory sent a Benedictine monk called Augustine, not the famous church father, to bring these Angles and their Angle land under the power of Rome and her church. His emissary, Augustine of Canterbury, landed in Kent in 597, and the rest, as they say, is history. It explains why Canterbury, the most important city of the Kingdom of Kent at the time, became the centre of Roman Christianity in this country, and why we now have an Archbishop of Canterbury leading the Church of England, rather than an Archbishop of London or Cheadle or wherever. Gregory the Great specifically wanted England to be linked in with his network of churches centred on Rome. There were Christians already in England, of course, since uh, Roman times the, the gospel had been here, and made an impact. Some even say the gospel figure of Joseph of Arimathea brought the good news of Jesus to these shores in the first century. Some people, of course, think that the feet of Jesus in ancient times walked upon England's mountains green. Whether that's true or not, you'll have to ask Ian Chidlow. But what is true is that Pope Gregory wanted to evangelise England in his way and link us up with his network on the continent. A sort of European union of Christianity. The native Christianity here at the time, Celtic Christianity we might call it, was more monastic. It had powerful and influential abbots who ruled over various church plants, I mean uh, areas of monastic growth and evangelistic activity. Celtic Christians did, did have bishops, but the bishops did what the abbots told them to and had more of a spiritual focus than an administrative one. Because they were so busy taking over from the decaying Roman Empire at the time, Gregory's Roman bishops were much more like district administrators with far greater and wider responsibilities within church and civic life based on a territorial system called a diocese. 
you can see how this system has got us into the mess that we're in today in the Church of England, you know, with bishops sometimes seen as overburdened estate managers and administrators and pseudo politicians rather than learned theologians with missionary zeal. Oh, for the old Celtic days, eh? Well, still, the, uh, as the church became more of a, a national institution, uh, it did need some kind of increased structure and organisation. So the change after the Gregorian mission was not all a loss, in a way. But Augustine of Canterbury and others who uh, followed him as archbishop began to claim authority and supremacy over things everywhere, which wasn't very comfortable or acceptable for indigenous Christians. They clashed particularly over the date of Easter. Seems a silly thing now, doesn't it? But it could be confusing, I suppose, if different Christians in the same area were celebrating Lent and then Easter at different times, according to different traditional ways of calculating the date. Anyway, back to Gregory. As well as being a very uh, competent organiser and leader, Gregory was also a great writer. Two of his most famous books are his commentary on the book of Job and his pastoral rule. His commentary on Job is extremely long. In fact, it's one of the longest pieces of literature to survive from the period. It is almost 2,000 pages of Latin, commenting on every verse of Job. But it's also full of great insights and wisdom which helped to shape Christianity in Europe and beyond. He began writing it when he was the Pope's ambassador in Constantinople, in Turkey, as we now call it, and uh, didn't finish it until several years into his time as Bishop of Rome. It's a literal and historical exposition of Job, with some allegorical interpretation and moral reflections built into it all the way through. I guess it is such a huge commentary because there's a lot to say. As he himself says in this lovely quote that I, uh, I really like about the Bible, he says, Just as the word of God puts to the test those who are learned in his mysteries, so also it often refreshes the simple with clear teaching. It is publicly proclaimed and it nourishes children. Its private suppers hold the minds of the wise in admiration. Perhaps I might say it is like a river, both shallow and deep, in which a lamb walks and an elephant swims. Gregory, of course, was obviously an elephant himself, but scripture, as he said, grows with the person reading it. And so the older and wiser he got, the more he saw and learned in it. His second famous book is his Pastoral Rule. Essentially, it's a book about pastoral care of individuals. Everybody is different, and so to be a good pastor, he says, we need skill to discern where people are at spiritually and how we can best help them. Caring for souls, he says, is the art of arts. And when people are preaching, they need to remember the diversity of their congregation. Not their racial diversity so much. He has far more categories of people in mind than simply uh, black and white or something like that. Uh, just uh, to give you some of the list, he talks about how we need to apply the, the Bible differently to uh, men and women, the poor and the rich, the joyful and the sad, servants and masters, the wise of this world and the dull, the impudent and the bashful, the forward and the faint-hearted, the impatient and the patient, the kindly disposed and the envious, the simple and the insincere will need different applications, the whole and the sick, the too silent and those who spend too much time in speaking, the slothful and the hasty, the meek and the passionate, the humble and the haughty, the obstinate and the fickle, the gluttonous and the abstinent and many, many other types of people who all have to be pastored in particular ways with individual care. So there he is, Gregory the Great, the last decent Pope, as uh, John Calvin said. 
He was an organiser, a singer and a leader with a missionary heart, a busy pen and a personal touch in pastoral care. We may not agree with everything he ever said and did and wrote. I mean, there is some quite wacky stuff in that Job commentary about the Antichrist and so on, which I, I was reading recently. So it does need a little bit of careful sifting. But hey, what a guy. Gregory the Great, indeed.